uh, and the audience. This is a meeting of the Select Committee on Earthquake and Disaster Preparedness, Response and Recovery. I wanna thank you all for being here this morning. We are going to be on a very um, tight timeline in that uh, we have session at two and I wanna thank the speakers and the press that are here today for dealing with the changing time of this scheduled uh, hearing. We will be here today to talk about the impact of the, Japan, the earthquake in Japan on California and the lessons learned. First, I would like to say that we are, of course, very concerned about our friends in Japan. Our heart goes out to them. They are in our prayers. And we are watching as the country deals with this uh, devastating disaster. And I think it is um, very important for us to acknowledge that the country of Japan has always been a leader in preparedness. And always had great and strong standards with regard to preparedness and building standards and those sorts of things. So we know they have worked hard to be prepared. Our prayers go out to them. Uh, we also want to know that there are many people, I want you to know that there are many people who are looking for ways to help and the American Red Cross has set up a fund to help victims in Japan. If anyone is interested in helping out, of course, you can contact the Red Cross on their webpage or by calling 1-800-RED-CROSS. We thought it was very important to convene a hearing as soon as possible uh, after the events in Japan so that we could have a report on the impact in California and explore ways for California to be prepared in the event we have a similar disaster. I also want to note that this is just part one of, a he of hearings. Uh, in addition to the items on today's agenda, we will be con convening a part two hearing in about a month's time to focus on readiness in schools, hospitals, infrastructure, and how earthquakes can impact the economy. I've had the opportunity to work on seismic issues throughout my uh, political career, especially when it comes to schools, and this is a very important conversation we need to continue. Today, of course, we are focusing on the damage that was done in California uh, with regard to the tsunami along our northern coast, in Santa Cruz, other parts of the coast, and also to explore the safety at our nuclear and natural gas facilities. We have all watched with concern as Japan has struggled to stabilize the nuclear, its nuclear plants and we of course been worried for the people that have worked at those plants and the people who live nearby. While California's plants have been built to withstand large earthquakes and tsunamis, it's time to review the safety of these plants in light of what we are learning from what has happened in Japan. According to the California Seismic Safety Commission, there is a risk of major earthquake in California on the order of two to three percent per year. And according to the 2007 Working Group on Earthquake Probabilities, Cali California faces a 99.7 percent chance of a magnitude 6.7 or larger earthquake during the next 30 years. The likelihood of an even more powerful quake of a magnitude of 7.5 or greater in the next 30 years is 46 percent. We all know how important it is to be prepared, but the events of past, the past week or so have brought that message home to us even more. Today we will closely examine a number of these issues. First we will hear from experts on California seismology. They will tell us what to expect, uh, whether there can be an earthquake similar to that which was experienced in Japan. And we will also hear about the damage of the tsunami and our response and readiness for the next event. Our third panel will explore the very important issue of seismic safety at our nuclear power plants. And finally, in the fourth panel, we will discuss the safety of our natural gas infrastructure. Thank you to all the speakers for being here today for this extremely important discussion. And I would like to pause for just a moment. Senator Wright and Senator Leno has joined us and Senator Blakesley is joining us as well. I would like to ask at this time if anybody has any brief opening comments before we go to the first panel. All right, thank you very much. So our first panel uh, is Keith Knudsen, Deputy Director of the Earthquake Science Center U.S. Geological Survey, and John Parrish, our California State Geologist. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you very much for sticking within our tight time of 13 minutes for the both of you. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to speak with you again if we don't get through all of the information today, but thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting us. 
So I was asked by the Senator's office to talk a little bit about what's happened in Japan. Um, this is this map on the right is one of the first things we do after an earthquake anywhere in the world. It is uh, what we call a shake map. The star shows the epicenter, which is determined in really seconds after an, a uh, large earthquake. Mr. And Knudsen, can I ask you to pull the microphone in just a little bit closer so we can hear you a little bit better? Pardon me. Thank you. Sure. Is that better? Yes, I think so. Okay. So the star represents the epicenter. The colors here represent the intensity of shaking. The brighter colors represent more intense shaking. And uh, what I'd like to point out here is something that a lot of people have missed about this earthquake. This polygon here represents the area of the earth that ruptured during this earthquake. It, there wasn't just rupture at this epicenter, but that entire area, roughly an area 300 by about 150 miles in dimension. Um, this is a tectonic setting in Japan. Uh, this yellow star is where the epicenter occurred, where the earthquake occurred. These red circles are uh, only magnitude seven or larger earthquakes. So in the historical period, all these red circles uh, show historical earthquakes. Very seismically active area. The yellow triangles are uh, are volcanoes, and the blue circles are earthquake, blue and green circles are earthquakes that occurred at greater depth than the one we just experienced. So what's driving, what's caused this earthquake is the collision of the Pacific plate with this plate here, which some people refer to as the Yakutsk plate, along this black line, which is the Japan Trench, or that's a fault separating those two plates. If we look in cross-section of the Earth, all these circles represent earthquakes down to 200 kilometers or so. Again, the yellow star is the epicenter of this earthquake, and this defines the boundary between those two plates. It's very shallowly dipping, um, and so what's happening is over here on the east, the Pacific plate is being shoved beneath the uh, continent of Japan here, and these two plates are colliding at a rate of about 80 millimeters per year, roughly 3.3 inches. This is, uh, again, the yellow star shows the epicenter. The blue circles show aftershocks, many, many aftershocks, but not an unusual amount given the, uh, the size of this earthquake. And here this shows the convergence rate between the Pacific plate and the Okutsk plate. Um, and this white box, again, is the approximate definition of the area that ruptured in this plate boundary during this earthquake. Um, this was about the fourth largest earthquake in uh, modern history since we've been recording these, these uh, events with seismometers. Um, most of the fatalities were caused by the tsunami, not by the shaking. This event was about 30 times more powerful than our 1906 earthquake. It was about 900 times more powerful than the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, and it's the largest earthquake to strike Japan in uh, modern times. And we're frozen. I just take the time to catch up. Hmm. <coughs> I hope this is interesting to everyone. We're spending more time than I anticipated here. I'm not sure what's going on with uh... Senator, Senator Vargas, you want to ask a quick question? Just, just a quick question. When you say 900 times more powerful, what is nine? I mean, that, that to me seems so astronomical. It, it, it is astronomical. The, it, that's, uh, if we think about the amount of energy released during the earthquake, roughly 900. But it's not 900 times more destructive. I mean, it's just 900 times more powerful. Um, I'm not sure no, how sir. destructive, what, what destructive okay. means, but in terms of, we try to uh, characterize the amount of energy released, and the amount of energy is a is measure of, or related to the amount of destruction. Thank you, Manager. Okay. Um, ah, good. Um, these little squiggly lines are records that seismologists look at. Each of them are uh, from a different point along the coast of northeastern Japan. The important point I'd like to make is these records go on for one, almost 200 seconds. So the shaking that these people experienced, the, we've seen some of the videos online, the shaking went on for two to three minutes in many places. 
an earthquake early warning was issued by the Japanese, a tsunami warning was issued by the Japanese and then by some of our agencies. And again, as Senator uh, Corbett described, Japan is probably the most prepared country in, in the world. Um, I think people have probably heard that the, uh, the crust or the continent of Japan shifted during this earthquake. These, each of the, uh, this, is, this image on the right is a blow up of this area right in here, and each of these arrows represents, the end of the arrow represents a GPS station location, and the length of the arrow represents the amount, the distance that that station shifted as a result of this earthquake. This line down here is for reference, it represents one meter long. Parts of Japan shifted to the east as much as four meters during this earthquake. This is a tide gauge record from uh, the coast near the Fukushima area that we've heard, about, heard so much about. This um, blue line here is the normal tidal cycle and it's at this point here where the tide diverged from norm and a tsunami was recorded. And uh, you can see that each of these squares is about one meter. So at this point here, there was almost four meters of difference between the normal tidal cycle and the water elevation due to that tsunami at this location. One of this lower plot, what we've done is we've removed the tidal cycle. So we're just looking at the record from the earthquake and the tsunami. And you'll note that the, the water level at the sea cruises along steady here at about zero, and then the earthquake occurs, and then it's centered on this line up here. What this tells us is where that tide gauge is located, the earth subsided 40 centimeters, about this far. It's permanently displaced downward, so that area of the coast is more susceptible to flooding from here forward. Um, this area has experienced many tsunamis and large earthquakes historically in 1896, 1933, and it experienced, it was uh, very severely damaged by the 1960 earthquake where the tsunami was generated in Peru. Um, there are earlier tsunamis from geologic time, and on the left here, we show the timeline of events. The Japanese issued a tsunami warning, they issued their earthquake warning, and our NOAA and Pacific Tsunami Warning Center issued warnings, and this is one of their figures that shows the time till, the time following the earthquake when the tsunami impacts will first be felt. So here in California, about 10 hours after the earthquake occurred, we began to sense the uh, effects of the tsunami. Um, so eight seconds after the earthquake, the Japanese early warning went out. About three minutes, the tsunami warning went out. Six minutes later, maps like this were produced by NOAA. Ten minutes after that, the USGS, my organization, estimated the first magnitude at 7.9, or first estimated the magnitude. Um, about 15 minutes after the, the earthquake occurred, the tsunami was beginning to impact the coast of Japan. Um, 42 minutes later, we revised the magnitude, and then the uh, tsunami made its way across the ocean. This shows predicted displacements or amplitudes of the tsunami wave um, as they would strike different parts of the world. Here is our coast over here. And again, this, this comes out in minutes after an event anywhere in the Pacific Basin. This is something we captured, one of my colleagues captured off Japanese television. It's their tsunami warning telling people that they need to move inland. And the pink area shows the areas inundated by the tsunami. Tsunamis made as, their way as far inland as, uh, as much as five kilometers. So they had a few minutes of warning. The uh, beginning of the, the first phases of the tsunami hit the coast at about 15 minutes. People couldn't, if they're on foot, they can't make it five kilometers in, in the amount of time necessary to evacuate. Um, so we're getting asked all the time, can we have an earthquake like this here in California? This map shows the historical subduction zone earthquakes like this Japanese earthquake. This here is the Japanese earthquake, magnitude nine. Um, this was an earthquake in 2004, the Sumatra earthquake. This was the 1964 Alaska earthquake, 1952 up here in the Kuril Islands, or is that Kamchatka, and then two down here in South America. So can California experience earthquakes like this? The answer is yes, but northernmost California. Here from Cape Mendocino north to or that includes Oregon and Washington can produce and has produced earthquakes 
comparable in size to this earthquake we just experienced, the last one being in January of the year 1700. Um, the other place in the U.S. that can produce earthquakes and be and generate tsunamis is the coast of Alaska. Um, there's been some recent work looking at the sources of tsunamis to different parts of the coast of California. And here, we're, if we're thinking about this area, Port San Luis, the, the earthquakes likely to contribute most to the hazard at this area, the tsunami hazard, are up here in Alaska and over here in Kamchatka. Uh, I have three more slides to, to get at a little bit this idea of how big was this earthquake and is it unusual that we're having earthquakes of this size? So we said earlier that this earthquake here, the, the vertical axis is the magnitude, and as we go through time from 1900 through the present, we move from left to right on this figure. This earthquake here labeled Japan 2011 is really a magnitude nine, so it's one of the fourth or fifth biggest we've had since we've been able to measure these things. This is a plot where each year the number of earthquakes greater than magnitude seven are summed up and a horizontal line is drawn at the number of events that occurred in that year. This point, the, the point of this is that this is a very random process. We have, some years we have as much as 20 or 25 greater than magnitude seven earthquakes around the world. Sometimes we have as few as four or five. We're three months into the year, we've had about seven magnitude seven earthquakes if we don't count after, aftershocks. It's within the, the randomness of these natural processes. And this is a plot of the same information. So we're looking at the rate of, occur of, rate of occurrence of earthquakes through time. If this changed radically, the slope of this line would change as time goes on. Because it's a relatively constant slope, we interpret that to mean that these, the magnitude seven earthquakes occur at about the same rate and we're really not in an unusual period. And I'll finish with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're gonna hear from the state geologist and then we'll go into questions for both of them if that, that's okay, senators. Thank you very much. Mr. Parrish, welcome. Thank you. Let me just uh, get that up to Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting us uh, here today. I'll be very brief. I'm going to go through these uh, relatively fast. Um, as you know, California is uh, geologically and environmentally the most diverse state in the Union. And uh, we have 15 distinct geomorphic provinces. We're also the most seismically active state in the Union uh, after Alaska. Uh, the California has a population of 38 million people, uh, and we operate the eighth largest economy in, in the world, and we've built it on the most seismically active area in the United States. As far as uh, faults go for California, uh, we've mapped around 15,000 faults in the state. Uh, we have about 700 active faults that we have managed to find names for. Uh, these, uh, these particular faults, as you can see, most of them are along the, the, uh, the west coast of the, of the state, and that is where most of the infrastructure, the businesses, and the population uh, have um, accumulated. Nationally, 75% of the earthquake risk in the United States is in California. This is according to FEMA. And you can look and see that Alaska has just a minuscule risk because their population is 700,000 people uh, over about 650,000 square miles, whereas California, 164,000 square miles and 38 million people, the impact and the risk to us is considerable. We have expected total losses by county uh, based on the earthquakes, and you can see the hot zones, which are around the Bay Area, uh, Los Angeles, Orange County, San Bernardino. Uh, these are the areas w that annually suffer the most damage uh, because of earthquakes. This is on an annualized basis. Historic earthquakes in the state of California. Uh, there have been about 17 or about 15 uh, magnitude seven earthquakes in the last 200 years. Uh, that's about one earthquake for every 12 and a half years of magnitude seven or greater in the state. 
as the chairwoman mentioned earlier, um, California uh, has a 99% chance in the next 30 years of experiencing a magnitude 6.7 earthquake or larger. A magnitude 6.7 earthquake is equivalent to the Northridge earthquake that killed 63 people and had $40 billion worth of damage. Uh, and that is the small earthquake on this particular scale. You notice there's about a 46% chance of a seven and a half uh, earthquake, and as we've noted statistically, every 12 to 13 years is a magnitude seven or better earthquake in uh, the state of California. Just looking at the San Francisco and Los Angeles areas, those are the two largest uh, financial and population areas. There's a 63% chance in San Francisco of a Northridge earthquake or a larger striking, and a 67% chance in Los Angeles of that same style earthquake in the next 30 years. If we look at all the faults in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a 70% chance that there will be a Northridge style earthquake there. Uh, an earthquake of these magnitudes could be devastating to an area such as Los Angeles or San Francisco because they are now fully developed infrastructures with a very dense population. Earlier earthquakes in these areas uh, uh, were less devastating because of the lack of population. Uh, an earthquake in Los Angeles, the scenario was done on the Great Shakeout of 2009. Uh, it's expected a magnitude 7.8 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault, which is 35 miles east of Los Angeles, would do $213 billion worth of damage to Los Angeles alone. Uh, we also produce these uh, earthquake shaking potential maps. The hot colors show the areas most uh, likely to suffer extensive damage or experience extensive shaking from earthquakes. And you notice that's right along the coastline in the major population areas of the state. There's approximately 28 million of the state's 38 million people that live in these uh, reddish areas. California's been in the business of uh, trying to plan for earthquakes for quite some time. These are some early uh, earthquake planning scenarios. The one on the left is for a magnitude uh, 8.3 in Los Angeles, done in 1982. It's now obsolete, of course. And 1995 on the right, which is the Cascadia subduction zone, which can have a magnitude 9 Japanese-style earthquake. This was done back in 1995. It also is obsolete uh, today, but we are working on new programs and, and new materials. Under the uh, state's Alquis Priolo uh, Fault Zoning Act passed in 1972, uh, the state maps uh, active faults. Uh, we have mapped uh, 5,000 miles of surface rupture faults here. It, uh, according to the act, it is forbidden to build structures for human habitation across the trace of these active faults. We have produced about 546 of these maps. They are now interactive on the website, so anyone can put in their address and find out where they are in relation to uh, one of these AP zones. This is an AP zone map. You can see the zoning that's gone on. This is the Hayward Fault that goes through the East Bay area. The Hayward Fault's considered one of the most dangerous faults in Northern California. Should it rupture, there will be a great deal of devastation on the, uh, the east bank or the, the east part of the bay. And also uh, in 1994, after the Northridge earthquake, the legislature passed the Seismic Hazard Zoning Act. In this act, uh, we zone areas of earthquake liquefaction and landslides. These become zones of investigation and uh, for local lead agencies. The green areas show liquefaction zones. This, of course, is up in the Bay Area. And California landslide areas are shown in the blue areas. And this, of course, is, is uh, Mission Bay Area. California in 1971, by act of the legislature, commenced the Strong Motion Instrumentation Program. This is now the largest strong motion instrument program in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, CGS acquires data from the Strong Motion Program, which goes directly into California's building codes for making its buildings more resilient to earthquakes. 
uh, ShakeMap is a development of the uh, USGS, and as part of the California Integrated Seismic Network, uh, these are the maps that are produced uh, following an earthquake in California. These maps are sent out along with this information to emergency response managers so that they can react very quickly to earthquakes uh, uh, where they see the most uh, damaging shaking. I'll skip through the engineering center uh, and go directly to tsunami hazards. Uh, as this is a tsunami hazard uh, pictorial uh, indicating what would happen if a tsunami occurred in the Aleutian uh, Islands. And you can see it would give California around four or five hours uh, notice. If there were a tsunami that were to occur in the uh, northern part of the state, I'm sorry, an earthquake in the Cascadia subduction zone, we would have less than 30 minutes warning in uh, Northern California to evacuate those areas. Uh, one of the things that's helping California is the offshore geologic mapping program. The impact tsunamis have on a coastline is directly proportional to the geometry and the geology of the seabed and the geometry of the harbors. And so we are attempting to map this. This is Monterey Bay. Uh, on the left side, you can see the coastline and the land on the right. Uh, in December of 2009, uh, we completed uh, working with the California Emergency Management Agency, the first set of tsunami inundation maps for the state. Uh, these maps, about 130 maps, uh, cover 1,100 miles of the coastline. These maps are available online for anyone who wants to put their address in, and uh, they can get a map with the Google base on it showing the three-dimensional effects there. This is typical of uh, one of the maps. This is the San Diego map. The pink area shows the inundation zones that would occur during a, a, a worst case tsunami. We are also working uh, with uh, state agencies on um, high resolution modeling, on uh, probabilistic uh, inundation maps, which would be the next generation, and on offshore safety zones for ships, uh, how far offshore they should stand given the amount of time they have before um, a tsunami hits, as well as developing in-harbor hazard maps uh, for FEMA throughout the state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Mr. Parrish and Mr. Knudsen. I know we have a lot of questions for you, and we're going to start with Senator Sam Blakesley. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a quick, a quick question, question to Mr. Knudsen um, regarding the Japan earthquake. Now, could you share with us a little bit uh, about uh, the degree to which this uh, earthquake was, uh, the size of this earthquake and the location of this earthquake was anticipated. Uh, obviously we don't do very well predicting when earthquakes will occur, but we do put a lot of work into trying to assess uh, where earthquakes might occur and how large they might be. Could you talk to uh, the disparity, if there was any, uh, between what was predicted in terms of size and location versus what occurred? Sure. Um, as you described, you use the P word. We don't predict earthquakes. We, we forecast over longer time periods. And the Japanese do the same thing. And Japanese uh, scientists and engineers have produced hazard maps just like the ones John showed us, uh, where they forecast the levels of shaking over different time periods. In this area, the most likely earthquakes that they considered were magnitude 8 earthquakes and not magnitude 9 earthquakes, is my understanding. Now, why do you think it is that a magnitude 8 earthquake was considered more probable um, in this location? Well, we learn something with every earthquake. And I, we certainly learned a lot with this earthquake. And because of the abundant instrumentation in Japan, we learn a great deal. Um, there are some geologic studies that indicate earthquakes and tsunamis of this size happen about every thousand years in this area. And I was not involved in the generation of the Japanese hazard maps, but um, I, I imagine that the next version would have included the possibility for magnitude 9 earthquakes based on this recently uncovered geologic information. I would hope so. I think that's really not the point, <laughs> uh, that we'll be able to retrospectively uh, have a better expectation as to what could occur after, in fact, something has occurred. What I'm getting to is a report that I read that a much smaller earthquake, much along the lines that you were describing, was anticipated for this area uh, because um, the area, the faulting in the area was um, more highly segmented and wasn't seen to be a large linear feature which could break simultaneously. 
Is that similar to what you've heard and read? Um, it is. I, I'm not an expert in Japanese uh, subductions on earthquakes, but my understanding is that these magnitude 8 earthquakes were uh, what were more considered more likely. And the magnitude of an earthquake is proportional or, or related to the area of the fault that ruptures during the earthquake. So it was considered that smaller patches of the fault would rupture than ruptured in this most recent earthquake. And I think this line of a question will become more important later when we talk about uh, risk in California because much of our risk assessment is based on making certain assumptions about whether or not certain faults that may be modest or large in size connect up to, to create what could, other, could become earthquakes that are very large or very large. And so what I'm hearing you say is it's, it's not surprising that sometimes we underestimate the potentiality of a fault system uh, like we did in Japan. Yeah, we tend to produce probabilistic maps at, at this time, uh, which is a considerable improvement over what we used to do, which was just think about the um, deter from a deterministic perspective, and we do try to account for the range of possibilities that occur, and I think we do, are doing a pretty good job of that. But like I said, we learn from every earthquake. Members, I have a few questions. Any other members have any questions before I, Senator Vargas? Well, just on, along the same lines, I mean, everyone worries about the big one, that you know, that you're going to have a much larger earthquake than expected. I mean, I think that that is what happened in Japan. And I know when you were going through it saying, well, there's probability maybe up in the northern part of the state, you know, the Hayward Fault, but uh, I always uh, understand that uh, you could have something that, I, I represent the area down in Imperial County. And we've had quite a bit of shaking there recently since that, that last Easter, and they keep feeling it down there. And the question is, you know, well, is this sort of the beginning of a much larger quake? And keep hearing from people, well, it's unlikely that you're going to get the really big one, but doesn't this, I mean, what we're seeing now in Japan, doesn't this bring up the issue that, well, you could have this really big one if you do have these, you know, quakes sort of triggering, if you will, the larger, larger faults? Yes, it does. Absolutely, you're quite right. And uh, the Baja quake the, uh, um, that we had in, uh, in northern Mexico, there was a magnitude 7 quake. And we're watching that as the aftershocks creep northward along the Elsinore faults mm -hmm. and, and uh, move up on the San Jacinto faults. Uh, the San Andreas down there uh, generally has a repetitive uh, faulting earthquake of 150 years, and the southern San Andreas has been 300 years before uh, uh, since it's had its last big quake. So the joining, the triggering of, of an earthquake on one fault, we're seeing that the energy can be translated to adjacent faults or linearly, linearly uh, down the fault to other segments of those faults, and that magnifies both uh, the energy release and the intensity of ground shaking. Thank you. Senator Kehoe. Thank you. Uh, yes, that Easter quake was uh, a real eye-opener. Uh, I've lived in San Diego over 30 years, and I never felt anything like it in North Park, right near Balboa Park in the city. Um, so it was a very uh, uh, startling. Uh, seemed like a very long time, but I'm sure it was just a few seconds. I had, you said it was a 7-magnitude uh, earthquake. I'd read somewhere at 7.2. Does that make a difference, and is one number more right than the other? I, I think you're right. It was a, a 7.2 earthquake, yes. And so what is that, what's a, the difference between a 7.2 and a 7? Uh, it, um, say, energy release maybe uh, three or four times. Three or four times mm -hmm. greater. And you said that they seem, the, the uh, tremors or aftershocks or whatever uh, appear, seem to be tracking north. Yes, that's correct. The, I, I no, realize we, you're just the first two speakers, but the, um, one of the critical issues in San Diego, of course, is, uh, is this new round of uh, quaking going to have a negative impact on, on San Onofre power plant, uh, you know, just uh, north of Camp Pendleton or at Camp Pendleton there? And so do you have any thoughts on that at this point, or should we wait until we get to our nuclear power section? Uh, I would, uh, I'd say I'd wait till you get to the nuclear power session. Okay. Let, <laughs> I will defer let that me, to the Let me rephrase engineers. the question. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, I will confine myself to the geology and the, and the earthquakes. I'm not certain what the San Onofre uh, engineers uh, have designed that plant for. But um, I'm sure they've taken into consideration whatever the uh, most uh, likely shaking will be. 
uh, at San Onofre. Very good, well then we will wait to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Kehoe. I have a couple of questions as well, uh, sort of on the lines where Senator Blakesley was going. Uh, obviously, we, we have gotten a little better at, based on past history of, I don't know if I should use the word predicting, but understanding when future events may occur. Uh, however, it still is sort of an evolving science, and we learn from every earthquake. Uh, Along those lines, I, I believe also the determination of where new fault lines exist is also sort of an evolving science as well. Uh, we have established fault lines in the state of California. We have others that are, that are found, um, I don't know with how much regularity, but often. So I did want to, I know that uh, we are going to be talking with engineers from San Onofre and Dabble Canyon, but I did want to ask your thoughts on uh, the, uh, the evolving science around the shoreline fault, which is, uh, has been determined to be connected to the Hosgree Fault, which was, was uh, discovered uh, after the initial uh, engineering for the uh, Diablo Canyon fault line. So my point is just to sort of maybe touch on um, our understanding of predicting where fault lines actually will occur and how we take that into consideration and analysis for determining where we site various types of construction, whether it be uh, power plants or schools or those sorts of things. So maybe you can speak a little bit about that, the science with regard to determining where fault lines exist and the probability that we may find new fault lines in areas where they were not predicted to be in the past. Well, the, the issue with the, the shoreline fault is it's offshore. Now we have, we're pretty good at finding the faults that are onshore because they're visible and uh, we have a lot of uh, great ways of, of finding those. Offshore faults are a little more difficult to find because we can't actually walk around on the bottom of the seabed to see these. The shoreline fault was, uh, was discovered by the USGS where they started mapping uh, the epicenters, that is the earthquake centers, a lot of tremors that they had had, and they found that they all tended to line up on a plane. And because they were lining up on a plane, that indicated to them that there might be a fault that was there. And the more they looked into it, the definition got better and they uh, found that that was indeed a fault that existed offshore based on just the plotting of, of uh, hypocenters uh, where there had been earthquakes uh, below the surface. Now, following that, we can start taking a look at the seabed closer and see if that fault is expressed on the seabed. Uh, and start doing uh, more mapping and projecting as to what the plane of that um, near shore fault is. All right, and do you have any thoughts on, uh, we saw the map earlier, the uh, a potential uh, tsunami inundation maps from yes. earthquakes occurring along the Pacific Rim. Uh, and waves heading towards California. We have the ability to predict the patterns, I believe, of the waves. Do we have the ability to uh, predict with any certainty the level of the inundation? And the reason I'm asking this question is because obviously in California we have all types of um, you know, construction uh, along the uh, coastline yes. uh, from plants to residences, et cetera. So any thoughts on that? Yes, we do. We are modeling um, and we do have some historical numbers as well as models that we are preparing in uh, probabilistic modeling. Uh, we know that up in uh, the um, Northern California area, if there were a magnitude nine earthquake in Cascadia or a magnitude nine earthquake in the Aleutians, we could get anywhere from 20 to 30 feet tsunami wave in the Crescent City area. That tends to, um, to lessen as we move southward down the coastline, just because of the shape of California tends to bend eastward away from um, the direct focus of those waves. But um, San Francisco could have a, an eight or 10 foot wave. Uh, we saw a three meter, uh, nine foot wave in Santa Cruz coming in just on this one across the ocean. Los Angeles, 
uh, could have a 15 foot uh, wave. It could go uh, two to three miles inland there. Some uh, models indicate a 40 foot wave based on an offshore landslide. Uh, that's about a one in 3,000 year event. We do have uh, ways to predict the heights of these and that's what we're in the process of doing now. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation. We have one more question from Senator Blakesley, and then we'll move on to the next panel. Uh, thank you. Going um, back to uh, Deputy Director of the Earthquake Science Center, uh, Keith Knudsen with the U.S. Geological Survey. Was it one of your scientists that discovered the shoreline fault? It, it was a colleague of mine, and, and uh, her name is Jean Hardebeck. And she was able to take advantage of increased uh, instrumentation density yeah. and increased uh, technological understanding to relocate these very small earthquakes offshore and find that they uh, so the, are linear. these were a number of earthquakes that had occurred uh, uh, previously that were uh, then identified to lie on a single fault plane. Yeah, smaller, what we'd call micro-seismicity. Micro-seismicity. Right. Um, but these were earthquakes that were gathered on a seismic array that you operate? Um, you know, I'm not 100% sure, Mike. Um, I think, I think it's a some, of, it's some of them both. that we operate and some that PG&E operate, I believe, but I'm not sure about that. Why do you think it is that PG&E failed to find this fault if they had the same data uh, all these years? Um, I th We've been working in collaboration with PG&E on the science end. Um, they've been supporting the in increased instrumentation and funding increased scientific investigations. And I think it's in part because of that investment that we were able to identify this, this additional hazard. But the science of earthquake location and relocation is fairly straightforward. When I spoke with Dr. Uh, uh, Lombach, she identified an algorithm uh, developed uh, by Bill Ellsworth, which I was familiar with when I was doing my doctorate doctoral studies 25 years ago. Pretty simple a mathematical procedure to uh, precisely locate these earthquakes. And I was happy to see that she did that work and she advanced it with some tomographic analysis of velocity fields. But I'm a little concerned that PG&E, which had the primary responsibility for identifying the seismic safety of the facility and the seismic environment in which they were operating, failed to notice a fault of this size given the earthquakes have been occurring throughout time virtually right under their nose. I'm not sure you're asking me a question. I don't think I want to comment. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Blakesley. And thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, we have two more questions. We're about 15 minutes behind schedule, and we'll uh, have these last two questions, and we'll move on to the next panel. Senator Kehoe and then Senator LaMalfa. Thank you, uh, Senator Corbett. Uh, comment to the, you and the committee, uh, and you may already be planning on addressing this, but my understanding is that Senators Boxer and Feinstein have yes. asked for some reviews, and I hope that the information we gather is going to be coordinated with that effort uh, regarding yes, the nuclear power plants and, um, you know, any ge geologic issues that are uh, germane on our, co on our California coast. Um, so if we could, if I could be kept apprised of that, I would really Absolutely. appreciate it. Yes, we will, we will be sharing this information with the Senator's offices and asking questions a little later today about the response to those questions of those that are responsible. Thank you, Senator Kehoe. Senator Lamalfa, last question, then we'll move on to the Thank next Thank you. Uh, to follow on Senator Blakely's, Blakesley's thoughts there, <clears throat> what, what was the information that was available back in 1975 or 78 when, uh, you know, we were, we were talking about the, the possibility of these faults in, in that Diablo Canyon area? Because it seems to me like the technology for tracking this has developed a lot in that last 30 years or so. What did, what, what was available at that time? Yeah, I, I think that is true, and I think the, the mathematical relations for locating these, these micro seismums or small earthquakes has not changed. What has changed is the instrumental density and our ability to understand the velocity structure of the Earth. Both those um, improvements have allowed us to better locate these smaller earthquakes, and in doing that recently, we found that the earthquakes line up along this shoreline fault. And this is ever-evolving technology and information gathering. That's right. As we go. Yeah. Right. Thank you. 
Senator Blakesley. Is it true that pg e has a long-term uh, seismic program which has many in-house seismologists and geologists which have been working on this very issue of understanding the seismic setting since 1978 on a continual basis? Well, I think you should direct that to pg e but yes, they have an active program. Thank That's you. my understanding. Yeah, we can ask that question a little bit later on, Senator Blakesley. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your uh, very outstanding uh, presentation, and uh, we will have some more questions for you as this goes along. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Our next panel, and we're gonna try to move quickly so we can try to get close to back on schedule members since we do have session at two o'clock today. Our next panel will be on the impact on California uh, as a result of the earthquake in Japan, and our speakers will be Mike Dayton, Acting Secretary of the California Emergency Management Agency, John Laird, Secretary of Natural Resources, John McCammon, Acting Director, Department of Fish and Game, uh, Gregory Smith, Director of Disaster Services and State Response Coordination with the American Red Cross, and Dr. Howard Backer, Interim Director, Department of Public Health. As you're taking your seats, I think it's very important for us to take a look at uh, our response to date and its impact on our harbors and ports in California. And obviously, we're interested in hearing uh, what the Red Cross has to say and their service to uh, people who have been affected by this uh, this impact on our own coastline. And of course, we're very interested to hear from Mr. Backer as well on any potential health issues we should be concerned about. So our first speaker is Mike Dayton. And Mr. Dayton, if you could begin. Thank you so much for being with us. It's an important hearing. I know you're very busy, so we appreciate it. Um, you know, I'll jump right in on what our response was after we got the alert from NOAA. Uh, basically, we received the alerts from NOAA at the California Emergency Management Agency Warning Center that's staffed 24-7. So it's the State Operations Center out in Mather. So those alerts we passed on to our local partners. I mean, fortunately, we had plenty of time to prepare for since this was a long-distance tsunami. Um, we activated the Emergency Operations Center, and as local emergencies were proclaimed, the governor acted swiftly and proclaimed a state of emergency in four counties. Um, we also stood up a JIC, which is a Joint Information Center, and that was really a, you know, our attempt to reassure the public and to get the word out about the tsunami, because I think there was a perception out there with tsunamis that, you know, it's a one-time thing where we can say it's going to come at a particular time, but that's not the case. You know, it, it, the surges can last the whole day. So, so we stood up a Joint Information Center and worked closely with the media, some of the folks that are here today to get the word out to make sure we had consistent messaging on that. So the recovery staff, we also quickly dispatched to Santa Cruz and Crescent City, as those were the two counties that were hardest, uh, you know, that sustained most of the damage. So I had the opportunity myself to leave very early the next morning, go up to Crescent City, meet with local officials there, meet with the senator's staff. So, so and um, it was really to get eyes on, um, personally, to see the damage. I also had the opportunity to go down to Santa Cruz and see the damage in the harbor. So those are the two areas that were impacted most uh, significantly. And, and I can tell you the damages could have been much more severe. Uh, we were very fortunate that it had low tide, uh, that the, the tidal surges came at low tide. Uh, we were also fortunate the locals really invested wisely in their preparedness efforts. Um, you know, we've invested in sirens along the coast. Um, we've invested in reverse 911 systems um, that we've used federal homeland security dollars for. And essentially that is really where you can take one of the tsunami inundation maps that was talked about during the first panel and you can have an emergency manager at you know a local 911 center or an EOC and they can just draw you know an outline on a map of where that tsunami surge is going to come and they've made an agreement with the local you know, telephone companies that they make those alerts and say you are in an evacuation route, you know, you need to evacuate, you need to seek higher ground, and here's your evacuation center. So, I mean, by and large, the locals have prepared for this. We it, train regularly with the locals about tsunami hazards. And I would just take this opportunity that, um, you know, as we talk about the Cascadian subduction zone, there is a potential for, you know, a very low notice event in California along our coastline. And so that's why we try so hard to get the word out with our local partners and the public that you're not always going to have the benefit of an official warning 
warning from government. So you need to, to heed, you know, natural warnings. You need to heed if there's an earthquake and you're on a beach and you're in a tsunami zone, you need to seek higher ground immediately. Do not wait for an official warning. But, uh, but by and large, our local partners, they did great. So my hat's off to them, the emergency management and planning there. Um, and then, and additionally, on the recovery efforts, uh, the governor proclaimed, or issued an executive order which waived the one-week waiting period for somebody to seek unemployment because with the damages that are sustained in those harbors, there's a lot of fishermen that are out of work. There's uh, canning industry. So, I mean, we want our efforts just to run through them, and I know Fish and Game may go through them, but Santa Cruz as of this morning is at $26.5 million in damages. Uh, they've got 10 sunken, sunken vessels remain, or 10 sunken vessels in total, two remain to be raised. 77% uh, of the dock is open and accessible this morning. In Del Norte, up in Crescent City, there were 16 vessels sunk, uh, one has been raised, uh, 64 damaged vessels altogether. There's, in both uh, harbors, there's a large amount of debris, so I think most of the recovery work is going to be uh, focused on dredging after the initial environmental cleanup is because you have sunken vessels with oil. You need to get those out of the harbor. Uh, we're enlisting our partners at NOAA to do the underwater mapping to make sure those waterways are navigable. Uh, Mendocino County is uh, reports initial damages of $4 million. So we are up there today uh, with FEMA to do a joint preliminary damage assessment, and then we will have a total. But right now, we're at statewide, we're approximately at $43 million. Um, and again, if I can just um, go back to you know, our commitment to personal preparedness, I know uh, Ken Warman on my staff, uh, the chief of the hazardous mitigation branch, is pulling up myhazards.calema.com. CA.gov, and it's really, you know, on the first panel when you throw out the probabilities and the statistics, that can be very disconcerting for the public, but there is a place to go, the My Hazard site, where you can type in your address, and it'll show you what hazard zones or what hazards are in your neighborhood, but it, more importantly, it actually tells you what steps you can take to, to mitigate those hazards for yourself and for your family and for others in the neighborhood. So, so I encourage folks to look at that site. I know we're short on time, so I won't walk you through the site, but it, it is uh, very user-friendly. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dayton, and, and thank you so much for bringing up the fact that there is information available so people can be prepared. And this committee has had previous hearings and will have future hearings to you know, help educate the public as to how they can be better prepared. Let me just say just two quick things. One, thank you so much for working so quickly. I know you're working with other state departments to clear the harbors so people can get back to work and to lessen environmental concerns. Yes. So thank you for that. And just uh, our hats off to those that are so prepared up on the North Coast. Anyone who has traveled through that area, uh, you can't help but notice the signage for evacuation routes and shelter areas and those sorts of things. It truly is a, a remarkable, should be recognized, the work that is done in the North area. Senator LaMalfa, thank you for that. Thank you. So, uh, Senator, we're going to wait till after the panel. Okay. All right. We're going to take questions at the end of the panel, and uh, Senator uh, Alquist will be first. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be John Laird, Secretary of Natural Resources. Thank you for joining us today, John, and I know you're very concerned about your beloved Santa Cruz as we talk about the uh, concerns today. Thank you, and uh, I did go to see the harbor uh, right after, and I wanted to talk about the uh, agency response, and you'll be hearing, you've already heard from the geologist, you will be hearing from Fish and Game, but one of the ironies that existed <laughs> is as the waves were coming in, I was gaveling to order the Ocean Protection Council, and our major item that day was a scientific report on sea level rise and guidance <laughs> that we were adopting on sea level rise for local governments and people across California. And in the process, because it was a report that said, here the gradient of what a sea level rise might be in the next century in California and what some of the factors are that might drive it to a lower level or a higher level. And in the process, the scientists said, this isn't about sea level rise just growing and there's this gradual uh, increase. This is about severe events that drive the sea level rise home. Severe events such as a strong storm at high tide 
or the events that were experienced on that same day. And so it makes it even more significant for anybody that is in a coastal or bay area as something they want to consider in their response or for planning going forward. Uh, for the agency, you're going to hear from the director of the Department of Fish and Game for a minute. It was a key public safety responder uh, both before and after the tsunami. I know that in uh, they were all over the news in the Monterey Bay area for the fact that they were determining the effect of the sunken vessels and release of fuel in the harbor and its effect on, on fish and game. The Department of Conservation presented, they really do uh, tsunami data and planning and you heard from the chief geologist. The Department of Voting, Boating and Waterways has been assessing damage at the statewide harbors and they'll keep working with marinas on repairs. Uh, they also are looking at their loan program to see if there are any loans for any of the harbors involved that might be able to be restructured as part of the response activities. Uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation is one of the state's largest coastal land holders. So the Parks Department worked with local law enforcement officers to evacuate state park campgrounds and facilities that might have been at risk and patrol those sites to the, ensure that the public at large was not in danger. Uh, Cal Fire had a public safety presence along the entire coast, assisted in coordination of statewide resources and made reports uh, uh, to participating agencies about what was happening in each county and each area that was hit. And uh, one of the ones that's not well known is Cal Recycle because uh, it assists with debris cleanup in affected areas and I just know as somebody that was a mayor and a council member in a place where there was a 7.1 earthquake and we lost 60% of the buildings in our core downtown in that event that immediately our landfill was deluged with millions of bricks, wood, board, pavement, and other things, and that was one of the things that people did not anticipate would be something that required disaster planning. Cal Recycle was assisting in the debris cleanup uh, precisely with the same thing in mind. So throughout the agency, uh, we were doing, we're trying to work in a coordinated fashion to deal with the event as it happened in California. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Our next speaker is John McCammon, Acting Director, Department of Fish and Game. Thank you for being here at this busy time. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to tell you about the Department of Fish and Game's response effort. You might want to pull that microphone a little closer to you. Yes, Thank you. Um, the Department of Fish and Game's mission has grown substantially from one of game management to one having public trust responsibility for fish and wildlife and the conservation, protection, and management of those wildlife and the habitats upon which they de depend. This includes both public safety responses and response to oil spills in the state's marine areas. And even prior to initial contact by CalEMA, which was early in this case, the law enforcement division began deployment to provide proactive public safety response and reporting, wildlife monitoring, identification of potential pollution events and containment and remediation of any actual pollution events. Our uh, wardens were first on site and took actions to protect and prevent damage to departmental assets and equipment, monitor and report potential fish and wildlife losses and to provide security and law enforcement support in disaster areas. Warden were dispatched to all recognized harbors uh, and ports from Crescent City to San Diego and large department vessels were put to sea to avoid damage and to help with enforcement activities. Um, throughout the response, wardens have been underwater scuba diving on top of the water in patrol boats and skiffs and in the air assessing resource damage. Um, the fish and game oil spill uh, prevention and response function is responsible for responsible oil spills in marine waters. The Department Emergency Operations Center was uh, open day one of the response and spill staff provided initial support to media, logistics, scientific and liaison support uh, for uh, in, in anticipation of deployment. The Operations Center coordinates initial uh, deployment of personnel and information updates to the governor's office, the agency, the legislature and other state agencies and local governments. Uh, spill staff formed a unified command with um, the U.S. Coast Guard and with the Harbor Districts. Um, once the tsunami waves began to hit California, spills, uh, spill staff deployed numerous 
oil spill specialist to check the additional harbors all along the coast that initially reported minor damage. No pollution issues were reported with two exceptions. Forward operating bases were then established in Crescent City and Santa Cruz with the U.S. Coast Guard and OSPR staff. Regional personnel are continuing to receive first-hand reports of damage to commercial and sport fishing vessels, fishing-related businesses, and fishing-related infrastructure throughout the state. Additionally, our marine region is currently compiling a report of losses that will be finalized in the coming weeks, and I'll make sure that the committee has that report when it's finalized. However, we can say with some certainty that while there are impacts to individual sport and commercial fishermen and women, Overall, this event will likely not have an impact on the commercial harvest take, level of take or the industry as a whole. Um, most of Crescent City's uh, commercial fishing fleet left the harbor before the tsunami hit, uh, but those vessels are now 60 miles away from their home base and their fishing grounds. They're mooring in Eureka, by and large. Moorings and tie-up locations are scant, affecting both commercial and recreational boating communities. The Crescent City economy relies upon fishing industry, which at its peak, uh, was at its peak in the crabbing season and coming shrimping seasons. The current estimate is more than 1,200 gallons of petroleum and 326 gallons of oil were spilled. Uh, the numbers may change as we identify additional potential activities. And the Harbor Master is working diligently to try and recreate the infrastructure to allow for offloading a commercial harvest. Uh, we have issued a commercial fishing and boating advisory to prevent crab and other seafood from being contaminated and unmarketable. Commercial fishermen are advised uh, of the following protocol. Commercial vessels are advised to not run circulation pumps as they approach Crescent City Boat Harbor or within the Crescent City Boat Harbor. And we advise that they not pull crab pots or other traps up through water if a sheen is visible. Um, and that has gone out uh, a week ago now. Over 200 gallons of petroleum were removed from downed vessels in Santa Cruz. Debris, debris removal is being coordinated by Fish and Game, the Department of Boating Water, Waterways, Calima, and the Port Authority in Santa Cruz. And then um, we have done reconnaissance surveys for oiled wildlife and no oiled wildlife have been identified at this point. At the peak of the response, we had 77 personnel uh, involved uh, right now today we still have uh, 22 people on site in Santa Cruz and and in um, Crescent City and over the course of the event uh, 106 different people in fish and game were deployed so we were active in this activity thank you thank you so much you know obviously uh, your work is is uh, is wonderful at this time thank you so much for your uh, quick response and your diligence and uh, good luck to you as you continue to work through the impact uh, of the tsunami. Thank you very much. And our ne oh, next speaker is Gregory Smith, who's Director of Disaster Services and uh, Response Coordination for the American Red Cross. Welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Senators, thank you for the opportunity to uh, give you a brief snapshot. <clears throat> and please pardon my voice, I'm getting over a what everybody else is probably going to get or is getting over. Um, um, the, the opportunity to give you a snapshot of how the American Red Cross and other partner agencies in the state reacted to this, what I'll describe as an announced event, in that in our history and looking at other events, the, the earthquake last year in, um, in Chile, how a, a, a society has to respond to the earthquake, the initial earthquake, and then the tsunami and then the aftermath of both. So our response to the, the notification that we were indeed going to have a, a tsunami was to immediately activate our partner agencies and work with state, with the local and county emergency management agencies to establish evacuation uh, centers, points where people could get to high ground. In Santa Cruz, for example, we opened five sites and we serviced about 200 people at those sites because people were self-evacuating and going to friends and neighbors and they were going to the locations that we had established. In sharp contrast, in Del Norte, we had six centers open, and that had about 426 people um, in those in those um, those centers. Uh, we had seven fixed feeding sites and one kitchen that we used, and we used uh, we utilized about about 150, 175 or so volunteers. Now. The American Red Cross and our partners in response, we maintain a steady state of readiness because we're responding uh, to different 
disasters and emergencies in the community. So our ability to immediately respond to this type of event is, is very clear. When we practice for this, we train for this. But the challenge that we have is working with keeping this the top of mind in the in the public's mind, and then how the public will behave uh, in in reaction to to a notification like this. Um, some people evacuated, and we know we've seen it in the in the news. Some people actually move towards uh, a tsunami from a point of fascination or a point of of wanting to see how it's going to how it's going to look. So, in sharp contrast to our response to this, if you think in terms of right now in Japan, there are over 2,500 shelters opened. And one report that I've seen was that there, was, there were two distribution points, so points of distribution of resources, for about 60,000 people. So these are the things that we have the opportunity to look at to put the assumptions that we have for behavior and our ability to respond. Uh, will those assumptions, how will those assumptions play against what's actually occurring in Japan right now? So for our ability to respond to this announced event, I think that we were very ready. I think the public reacted well. I think the resources that we had in place and in play, the partnerships and the coordination that we had in place and in play worked very well. But I don't think that we should kind of sit back on that because, again, we're looking at only one half of the event that we would have to respond to. So all of this, and I think Mike touched on it, this is all a product of two things. The uh, personal preparedness, personal individual preparedness. So how prepared are we as individuals to react and respond and recover from this? And then second, how ready are the agencies, state agencies, county agencies, municipal agencies, uh, private sector, nonprofit agencies, how prepared are they and how ready are they to coordinate their activities following this event. So it's a constant state of, of addressing this for us. It's a constant state of readiness. So one of the, the, the questions that, that, that um, was, is, is on the table is, are we ready to respond to an event like this in California? And it's, it's, it's a, a somewhat subjective answer. Yes, we are in a constant state of being more ready to respond. We constantly train. We constantly exercise, but it's kind of like a size earthquake proofing a building. If it's okay, it's 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 good to 7.6. Well, what happens if it's 7.7? .7? So it's a constant state of vigilance on our part to maintain that state of readiness to ensure that we have the coordination at the state level, county level, and local level. Um, but it's a constant um, a constant uh, state for us to continue. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for the good work of the Red Cross in uh, helping those in need uh, during this uh, time as well, not only along the California coast, but of course the work of the International Red yes. Cross in Japan as well. It's so needed, uh, yes. your work. And uh, I'm sure anybody, we mentioned this earlier, uh, anybody who is interested in assisting uh, the people of Japan or even along the North Coast, they can contact people yes. at the Red Cross and you can put people to work, I'm sure. Uh, Absolutely. And again, the best way is to, to your financial contributions uh, to the American Red Cross and any other responding agency mm -hmm. allows that agency to get the resources that are actually needed uh, in this case. So that's the, the best way to help. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you very much. Yes. And our uh, next speaker in this panel is Dr. Howard Becker, uh, Interim Director of the Department of Public Health. He's going to speak about any impacts we should be concerned about or maybe we can feel comfortable about uh, uh, with regard to the, um, the nuclear drift. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Dr. Howard Backer. I'm the state's public health officer and the interim director at the California Department of Public Health. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank the chairwoman for her initial comments and add my concern and sympathy to those, uh, to the Japanese people and to the California citizens who have friends and family in Japan who are really impacted by this triple disaster. The California Health and Human Services Agency and the Department of Public Health really understand California's concerns over radiation exposure from the Japanese nuclear reactor that was damaged by this, this earthquake. And we agree that radiation exposure should be taken seriously. 
The California Department of Public Health has been in regular communication and contact with our state partners like the California Emergency Management Agency and uh, also with our federal partners like the, the U.S. Um, Environmental uh, uh, Protection Agency and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission through regular uh, email and teleconferences uh, to monitor the, and interpret the reports that we're receiving from Japan. Um, although some uh, information has been a little limited to date, we now have federal agency personnel on the ground in Japan uh, receiving accurate and transmitting accurate information, and we expect to coordinate and be able to interpret uh, much more detailed information coming from the site. According to all this available information that we've had so far from our federal experts, the United States West Coast are, is not expected to experience any harmful levels of radioactivity. This is primarily because Japan is 5,000 miles away and distance is a strong mitigating factor uh, for radiation levels. And as the particles do get dispersed on the days when the winds are blowing offshore from Japan, and uh, probably half the time they have, like today, they're blowing onshore, uh, the particles are dispersed or washed out of the atmosphere by rain. So our rainy weather has been working in our favor to wash uh, any particulates out of the atmosphere. The radiologic health branch in the California Department of Public Health and the U.S. Environmental Protect Protection Agency both routinely monitor radiation in California's air. And our radiation branch has increased the frequency of that monitoring. Uh, in addition, U.S. EPA has even added additional monitors in Hawaii and Alaska and Guam to try to get measurements uh, before they reach the, the West Coast. Um, we have had these radiation monitors in place actually since the 1950s. They serve multiple purposes, including detecting radiation from nuclear tests ar around the world, and we use that data to assess uh, health impacts. The, and to evaluate uh, impacts from incidents like the nuclear uh, power plant incident in Japan. To date, our monitors, uh, our uh, California monitors, have not detected any radiation levels that we can say are, are beyond the, the fluctuate, background fluctuations of natural radiation sources. However, other federal agency monitors have detected minute uh, amounts of radiation uh, attributable to the Japan incident, but the concentrations are less than one ten thousandth of levels that would be considered uh, to have any health impact. Uh, we are continuing to monitor these and we'll post the results of our monitors and the EPA monitors uh, f on our website for the public with interpretation. Because the radiation is not expected to have any health impact in California, no specific protective measures have been recommended to California citizens, such as uh, including taking potassium iodide. The Department of Public Health then has been uh, mostly uh, managing the information needs and the communication needs of this emergency in collaboration uh, with our Emergency Medical Services Authority and with our other state agencies like uh, California Emergency Management Agency. And we've activated our Emergency Management Operations Center uh, to handle this. We opened up a hotline uh, a week ago and over the course of last week we handled uh, uh, nearly 1,600 uh, <clears throat> phone calls from the public uh, with radiation questions or concerns. Uh, we also conducted telephone conference calls with our local health agencies and our other partners in, in, in health care. We've been distributing daily situation reports and fact sheets and, and questions and answers on our website uh, dealing with the radiation threat. So uh, we've received very positive feedback from these communication channels and continue to update and improve them uh, as the need arises. And I, I'm very pleased that this committee is focusing 
on the underlying risk, which is the massive earthquake. And uh, we feel strongly that the public's concern for protective action, uh, we want to encourage them to uh, follow through on, on protection, but the protection we would recommend at this time is not related to radiation protection, but protection against the Calif inevitable California earthquake that you've heard about. Uh, and at least the basic is to stop, be self-sufficient for three to five days. We've all seen after every one of these earthquakes that they cannot get sufficient help and resources into these affected areas during the first few days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Backer and uh, Dr. Backer, and thank you so much. I think uh, maybe people can feel a little more at ease based on the information that you've shared with us. Thank you. And of course, we're still so very concerned about our friends in Japan and, and the impacts that they are uh, experiencing. Senator Alquist. Thank you. My heart goes out to uh, our family and friends in Japan. I have two daughter-in-laws. One was born in uh, New Delhi and the other came from Japan five years ago and they are all safe. Uh, as the uh, Senate's representative to the Seismic Safety uh, Commission, uh, I really appreciate uh, Senator Corbett chairing this committee and holding this hearing. And uh, although we're concentrating on preparedness, response, and recovery, I'd like to speak a little more about preparedness because I don't feel quite as comfortable about it. And I'm going to uh, kind of paint a scenario and then ask how you all can work together. Uh, at least in two areas, I mean, the public expects that uh, California's uh, building structures are safe during an earthquake. And when we realize that we have 600 hospital buildings that have not met se seismic safety uh, standards, and when we also realize that I think it was about a year ago that there was legislation that would have exempted, um, that did exempt uh, community colleges from meeting the field act and that about four of us, myself included, voted against that. Um, given that whole scenario, I don't think we have, the majority of our buildings are all truly safe places. Hospitals need to be a place where people are healed, uh, but they also need to be a place where they're safe from uh, the building toppling on them. So given the problems both with hospitals and with schools, I'm really interested to know how can you all, and I guess I don't include the Red Cross in this, but I will ask you the other question on that, but how can the rest of you, and I would include Mr. Boyd from the Energy Commission, given that our nuclear reactors are built by GE and uh, built by GE also in Japan and you saw what happened there. Uh, how can you all work together to protect us to see that California really is a safe place? And then I would ask, uh, that's the first question, and then the last question, the second question to Mr. Smith would be, Given this information on hospitals and 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 community colleges, et cetera, uh, I think the work is still cut out for us. And, and what else can can the Red Cross do uh, to help us be more prepared? So, for the first question, if if the four of you could please respond, how would you work in accord? How can you work? I was going to just ask you a question like, do you think California hospitals are ready to handle the catastrophic needs? But they're not. So, how can you all work together to get the state to a place where we're in a safer place for people? Yeah, well, Senator, I know it's a great interest to us. Um, obviously, it's a great interest to us, the availability of hospitals, and that's, you know, one of the metrics we use when we start talking about a catastrophic scenario in either Los Angeles or the Bay Area is, you know, what, what hospitals are going to be functional. So, And our focus is really on uh, dealing with consequence management as the world is right now today. And it's where are those people going to go? Where are we going to be able to put them into available beds? So, I mean, we will focus on it and we can commit to 
you to tell you what a con you know what a catastrophic scenario would be, what the impacts on the hospitals would be today, and I think that's a larger policy discussion for all of us. But but we are committed to, to making you know as many beds available as possible and pre-identifying them before a catastrophic event. But can you talk about the state of California hosp hospitals and what would happen today? Well, there is, uh, in specific scenarios that, that we use in the Bay Area, there is, I mean, there is up to 80% of some of the hospitals may not be available if we see a ser uh, earthquake the size of 1906 in the Bay Area. And so, that, I mean, that is what we are planning then, for as thank, it is today. Thank you. And then what about Southern California? In Southern California, it, it uh, varies by, by the scenario, but it's, uh, in Los Angeles County, it could be up to 80. Um, percent that uh, are functioning so that so, are I mean, functioning, that is, that are functioning. Up to. Yep. Okay. and what about rural eastern california rural eastern california <laughs> yes <laughs> we do uh, actually those are uh, the numbers are better there but i can give you the specifics so those are better like, so yes. the bay, bay area <laughs> is the worst I would, I would say the Bay Area is, I mean, in our catastrophic planning, that uh -huh. is a major concern with the hospital. Uh -huh. So I can commit to you that it is certainly on our radar, well, and I would I'm like to work with you. I'm interested in the whole state. Absolutely. But we need we are to understand too. <laughs> all the ramifications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Alquist, and thank you for all your great work in this field of uh, seismic safety as well. Senator Kehoe. Uh, to um, Kalima and to the uh, Department of Public Health, can you give us uh, uh, a little bit more specific information on evacuation and other response procedures for the disabled? Sure, that uh, obviously Senator Keo, as you know, that's that's been a priority for us, and I, you know I meet regularly with the disabled community, and uh, we have issued planning, um, uh, you know, guidance for local emergency or local counties to implement to take the disabled into account during their emergency evacuation plans. We've also uh, set up what we call FAST team trainings, and it's functional assessment safety teams that would go out to a local assistance center, and then they would uh, be, a, as soon as we set up a evacuation center, I'm sorry, not a local assistance center, those, those assessors go out and assess any special needs, and then they're our point person to make sure that they get the care that they need during the disaster. So it's, uh, it's it's uh, ongoing, as Greg said, with right. the Red, Red Cross. It's, uh, how, how did it work in uh, Crescent City and Santa Cruz uh, over the weekend? You know, I, I went up there and I was, I was not made aware of any issues in that area. So, okay. I, and I asked at the town hall, so, so I think it, it worked well. But uh, if there's any specific cases, I can report back to you on that. I, I'd like to know, you, you said you attended a town hall, so you heard from a lot of citizens? Yes, I Okay, did. and public health, do you have a? Uh, there's uh, not much that I would add to that, but there's there's a couple of approaches. Um, one is in the planning phase, and it involves um, uh, multiple organizations. It involves the local emergency management agencies, and it involves many of our departments in California Health and Human Services Agency of mapping where our facilities are, making sure that our departments like um, developmental disability services, developmental services, and uh, aging and others have networks and utilize their networks and do uh, preparedness planning so that the uh, people who are responsible for the residential communities, since we've been downscaling and moving out of large state institutions into the community setting, the uh, people responsible in the community residential settings need to be have a, a degree of preparedness, um, need to be on a notification network if we need to, and they need to be linked with their local emergency management agency. So that's right. the first I, part. I think a lot of those needs ha have been identified, and I, Kalima, and I, is uh, public health part of the um, the advisory committee that looks at these issues? Um, yes. No, yes. Kalima. Yes. Okay. So. I guess what we, uh, we need to, uh, planning and ongoing planning, of course alerting re residential facilities and all is key, but uh, what about the, the uh, I think we need to get more specific, the disabled individual, the Californian who's at home, uh, 
but uh, you know, due to hearing loss or you know any other kind of you know Im immobility, a need for oxygen or special medication or equipment, um, are those individuals identified specifically by address? We uh, do not do an individual level registry. Uh, Is it done locally? Some of the local uh, jurisdictions may do it, but it has not been at a, a state level. And part of the reason is just the overwhelming number um, and how to identify. And, and also residents are a little wary about providing, frankly, about providing some of the information, feeling that it's, uh, it's personal information and they're not sure you know, how it's being shared. So that decision uh, is made uh, that we would not pursue that, that we were pursued at the local level. Uh, pursue overall planning at that level and we are also working on patient movement plans uh, the Red Cross may also have some comments on this yeah please uh, yes and, I'll, and to your your second question um, the, the the, the way that we look at even with hospitals, it's the, the, the partnership that we need to develop in order to, de depending on the severity of this event, how can we begin looking at things in a, in a non-traditional way? Where historically we look at placing people inside of buildings and providing them with, with sheltering services and feeding and hydration. Well, a lot of the, the information that we've gained from observing the aftermath of other events is that we have to focus on our ability to provide services in a, broad, in, a, in a broad perspective. So not just brick and mortar, but how do we support non-traditional sheltering? How do we co-locate services? So if the hospital is not able to take in, in uh, patients, then how do we co-locate that with a general population shelter? And certainly how do we continue to address and develop methods for providing services to all segments of the community, including uh, those to persons with, with a disability? So again, I said before, the opportunity that we have is to to observe how this these events have impacted the, the infrastructure in Japan, the hospitals in Japan, services to persons with disability in Japan, and how can we then modify our approaches to this. But all of this, I believe, when we say it, is, is consistency, it's partnerships, it's working again for that constant uh, state of readiness. But you, you make an excellent point in that and, and, and as I said, we can't just relax. It's a, it's, it's, it's constant because it's not really an example. Well, example that we use, we ask people, do you know where the Hayward Fault is? And if they say no, we say, well, go to Oakland and go to where the hospitals are, and you're standing on the Hayward Fault. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just have a couple of quick last questions and then we're gonna go on to the next panel. Uh, Dr. Becker, these are for you and possibly a couple questions for the for the for EMA as well. I understand we do have um, monitoring stations uh, for radioactivity along the coast. And I understand that there may be a gap between the San Francisco and Los Angeles area. Is that correct? There are, well, we don't need necessarily a continuous chain uh, all up and down the coast. We have them in northern, central, and southern California in terms of our monitoring stations, and then Cal, uh, the US EPA has uh, additional stations. So, um, you know, they were initially clustered around sites where there were nuclear power plants because that's where they would most want to monitor uh, radiation. When you're talking about nuclear events elsewhere in the world, it doesn't really matter because those are going to, you know, the, the radiation diffuses so widely that it would pick it up. For example, you might have read there was a report that the first detector to, find, to pick up anything was actually here in Sacramento because it happened to be a detector that was monitoring um, uh, monitoring uh, treaties internationally and needed to pick up underground uh, explosions of nuclear weapons, uh, testing weapons. So that's got to be extremely sensitive uh, type equipment and you know, it doesn't, it, you don't need a continuous chain of those because any radiation be very widely dispersed as it goes around the world. So you believe even though the permanent monitoring stations also provided by the US EPA, the fact that they are, there are gaps 
along the coastline, we still have adequate monitoring? Yes, I think that we would be able to detect um, any significant radiation f coming from Japan. Well, first of all, they know what levels of radiation are being emitted in Japan, um, and they know the weather patterns, so th for they can start making predictions from that, but uh, it, it, it would not come in a narrow stream. Uh, in fact, the prediction was that it would go to the north of us uh, mm -hmm. and be picked up first by uh, Alaska mm -hmm. and some of the states to the north. Mm -hmm. But there is a chain all along the west coast from Alaska down to our Southern California area. And I understand there are permanent monitors and deployable monitors. Deployable monitors are a little more sensitive to picking up traces of iodine? There are different types of monitors, and I would not, uh, it's beyond my technical knowledge to get into the, what precisely the differences are. All right, and I do understand too that the deployable monitors have been deployed to Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and Saipan, and I think you may have spoken to that a little bit earlier. What is the reasoning for that? Is it because of the, the weather patterns that you mentioned, the wind patterns? Or should we be concerned that Cal, excuse me, US EPA is not, has not deployed monitors to other parts of the California coast? Uh, no, the, uh, the, the reason I think it was, uh, it was in order to have different uh, measures of radiation on between Japan and the United States. All right, okay, so that doesn't cause you any concern? No, it does not. I'm okay. happy that they uh, put in additional monitoring. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Becker. Thank you. Senator LaMalfa has a last question for this panel. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, first, uh, Mr. Dayton, a phenomenal job that you, working in concert with uh, the locals up there in Crescent City, did on, on uh, the plan there, which mm. gladly you didn't really need all the plan other than the harbor there as the, as the way it hit, but uh, I heard great, great reports up there on that. Um, Thank you. Just a couple questions. One on this would be, as we're looking for uh, the federal emergency help and declaration there, um, is it the, the pattern, the plan to be able to have all of the different zones affected in the state as one Yes, it's declaration um, and reach the threshold so we can get that federal attention. Yes, Senator. The, traditionally, uh, FEMA uses a couple different criteria. The main one being the economic overall economic impact or damages to the state, and that's at 44 million. Um, as of this morning, we're at 39 million that we confirm with FEMA and ourselves doing the preliminary damage assessment. And uh, Mendocino is reporting 4 million on top of that. So we're 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 very close, and we're making sure we count everything and working with FEMA uh, for FEMA to entertain a request from a governor, it, they need to do the preliminary damage assessment. So we expect that to be completed early this week and we'll see where the numbers are and we'll certainly, uh, you know, keep it posted on if a request goes forward or not, so. Okay, but, thank, uh, you. thank you. And uh, follow up on that general topic, I do represent Crescent City up there along with the Sebingman Chesmero, good to see you. And uh, we're uh, um, looking to see how can we, and Mr. McCammon, maybe you could jump in, I hope, I wish Mr. Laird was here too, on how we can expedite getting the harbor back into shape as soon as possible and that uh, um, any permitting that's required or any, you know, normal obstacles towards doing things that they can be uh, um, smoothed or streamlined so that, uh, and I know you're working on, on the damage within the harbor as well, um, how, how can we expect, what, what can we expect as far as expediting any permitting required and that uh, sometimes in the process you would have um, when they're rebuilding that all of a sudden new requirements are, are brought in that were not part of the old requirements. Do we anticipate that they can be grandfathered, to use a term, that uh, to rebuild as they were without having a lot of new requirements for infrastructure? How can we make sure we expedite all, the, all this so that it's a, a shorter time possible because this is their living up there in that in that zone? I think for on behalf of the Department of Fish and Game, I think it's uh, fair to say that emergency response is treated differently and it has some exemptions provided for in the, in the mechanisms that are used for permitting. So if, if you're responding to an emergency and you're uh, making things 
uh, back the way they were in order to do your business, you have a certain flexibility under the permitting schemes that we have uh, than otherwise, and, and that, that would apply in the case of Crescent City and Santa Cruz, actually. So we, we can anticipate that rebuilding the harbor, even if they have um, to make it, they may make it sturdier in the process, that make it in a bit sturdier, but largely the same would not categorize them uh, too much differently. I, I, I know that in order to offload the uh, uh, commercial hall that we anticipate coming in shrimp season starts April 1st, um, that we're gonna have to get some uh, land-based uh, uh, cranes and so forth in there, on an, and those are going in on an emergency basis, exempt from the permitting requirements. That that's the one factor I'm a, I'm sure of in terms of the long-term rebuilding. I'll I'll be happy to look at it and get back to you. Yeah, we'd love to work with your office on whatever we can do to help that process. And and then lastly, on and maybe uh, Mr. Smith with Red Cross and uh, uh, Mr. Dayton with EMA. Um, I'm, I, I'm concerned too that if you know, we're talking about the hospital situation earlier and that if we have a dramatic enough emergency and we're talking lots of rubble, et cetera, hospitals, even if they're standing, may not be accessible. What do we do to make the emergency services and equipment and staff available in a high density area to take it to them instead of them having to get out or get to hospitals. What what are what can we do? As as it sounds like we are in this whole ring of fire or rim of fire. Excuse me, that's a Johnny Johnny Cash but in California. You mean the Johnny Cash song on your ringtone on your touch your cell phone? Yeah, you, you caught me, Wes. <laughs> the rim. If, if I could respond back. first to that, actually, um, you know, we have um, done planning with the local jurisdictions around both what we call alternate care sites and mobile field hospitals and invested in some assets um, statewide uh, for those and so that we can, uh, just like uh, Greg Smith was talking about setting up shelters in non-traditional areas, we're going to have to provide health care in non-traditional settings and it won't necessarily be what you'd expect in an ICU of, a, of, a, of an acute care hospital, but it will be able to offload the hospitals and provide much of the lower level of acuity care evaluation and treatment and release and even some inpatient care in alternate settings and well, we've got developed extensive also information for how yes. okay. local health departments can work with their partners to establish these alternate care sites and what are what are some of the alternative sites what, what do those look like besides you know the the, the armory or things like that. You, you talked about mobile ones. What, well, what is the they, status of that? These can be that? set up in, in, well, there's mobile field hospitals that can be set up in, in large open uh, fields. And then there's the alternate care sites that are intended to be set up within existing structures. It could be anything from a school to a gymnasium. And what's our, what's our readiness with that, with those resources right now at this point, especially in 2011 budget year California? Well, right now we have them stored in warehouses in three different locations within the state. Okay. Um, we have been asked to, uh, you know, because of the state budget crisis, to look at alternatives for maintaining these uh, that won't draw on our general funds, and we're in the process of looking at priorities now. Would you be able to contact us individually on the panel here on, on that status? Because uh, I, I just, there's more and more of this happening, and I, we got to have our readiness uh, as a service to the public for for that I think is very very key. I'll work with my legislative coordinator and we'll do that. Thanks so much. Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Assemblymember Chair. Very Hero. briefly, just Please. wanted to, first of all, thank you for letting me bust in on your hearing. Of course, we're glad to have you And here. secondly, I wanted to, on a bicameral, bipartisan basis, uh, echo Mr. Lamalfa's comments about the importance of getting the Crescent City Harbor up and running as soon as possible and doing whatever we can to expedite that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that line of questioning too. I, I, I have one last uh, quick question and that is for people who are concerned about the information made available by the monitoring, uh, is there a website where people can access this information? 
we're going to be posting this on uh, in our public health website or at least have the link if we decide to put it on the uh, environmental protection agencies but the, the, both the data will be combined and links will be on Cali MAs as well as our websites uh, for easy access the key is going to be the interpretation because I don't know what if people would understand what you know three uh, pico curries would mean or you know I mean I'm not sure I would so we, we need to get our radiation health experts, uh, of which we have fortunately in-house, to interpret this and put it in understandable terms. Great. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This is a very uh, wonderful panel. Thank you for your hard work, and we will be continuing to work with you as well. As I announced earlier, we will be doing another hearing that will focus on hospitals, schools, and infrastructure, so I imagine right. we will be hearing Great. from you again on these issues. Thank Great. you so Thank much. You. Our next panel is going to be taking a look at whether California's nuclear power plants are safe. Our speakers will be James Becker, Site Vice President of the Diablo Canyon Power Plant with PG&E. Carolyn McAndrews is... All right. Correction. Um, <laughs> Steve David. Steve David will be presenting for PG&E with regard to Diablo Canyon Power Plant. Please come forward. Carolyn McAndrews, Director of Licensing for San Onofre Power Plant with Southern California Edison will also be with us. Daniel Hirsch, Lecturer in Nuclear Policy at UC Santa Cruz and President of the Committee to Bridge the Gap. And Commissioner James Boyd, California Energy Commission. Uh, members, we are going to uh, start with this panel and hopefully we'll be able to finish the presentation of this panel before we have to go to session. So we will hold the questions until after the entire panel has completed. If we do not complete by the time session begins. I understand session will not be uh, very long today. We will come right back to this hearing room and continue where we left off, members. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. David, would you like to begin? Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, my name is Steve David. I'm Director of Site Services at the Diablo Canyon Power Plant. With me today, I have two of my coworkers, and just so you know who they are, I'll allow them to introduce themselves quickly. I'm Lloyd Clough, a director of, of PG&E's Geosciences Department. Hey, my name is Tracy Vardas. I'm with Emergency Planning with Diablo Canyon Power Plant. Okay, so thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I'd like to start first by just echoing some of the sentiments that we've heard here already. For me personally, the employees at the Diablo Canyon Power Plant and all PG&E employees, we've been watching the events as they have unfolded over the last 11 days, and certainly our thoughts, our prayers are with the people in Japan. So I just wanted to say that first. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is briefly go through a presentation. You should all have hard copies that discusses uh, our state of readiness and gives a facility overview for the Diablo Canyon power plant. I want to state that we're very proud of our operating history there. I believe we have uh, large margins to safety. Uh, certainly the two areas of concern today is what I want to speak to, both the seismic design and the design for tsunami. So just to kind of set the stage, if you look at the second slide there, or the first slide after the cover, basically the sequence of events that we saw uh, back on uh, Thursday two weeks ago, there was the large earthquake that caused the automatic shutdown of a number of the plants in Japan. They have 54 reactor plants in Japan. 11 of those were directly affected by the earthquake. Their seismic monitoring uh, instrumentation system did detect the earthquake. It exceeded the set points for automatic shutdown of those reactors, and 11 of the 54 did automatically shut down in response to the event. So they did operate as designed and the cooling systems did start, the emergency backup power systems did start. So they did respond appropriately to a seismic event that was greater than their design basis. What followed was a tsunami that was also greater than design basis, and that is what caused the majority of the problems that they experienced at the time and continue to experience. So as I said, the emergency diesel generators uh, actuated, but less than an hour later, those were disabled from the tsunami. Uh, remaining systems continued to operate and provide core cooling for several hours uh, until those systems also failed. So they were then in a situation that was beyond their design basis accident for the cores, and then additionally they had heat up in their spent fuel pools associated with each one of those units. 
if we compare the information for both seismic and tsunami between what the Japanese plant was designed for, what they experienced, and what Diablo Canyon is designed for, you can see that at the Fukushima Diachi plant, their ground acceleration design basis was 0.18 G. Okay, that's in force, ground acceleration force. What they experienced was between 0.2 and 0.35, so somewhere close to double of what their design basis was. For the Diablo Canyon power plant, we are designed to 0.75 G. Okay. For the tsunami wave height, theirs was designed in meters or uh, designed for maximum tsunami height of 6.5 meters. That equates to approximately 21 feet. The tsunami wave height they actually experienced was somewhere between 23 and 33 feet along that part of the coast, uh, dependent on the actual location. The wave height that we're designed for at Diablo Canyon is nearly 35 feet, 34.6 feet. If you uh, go to the next slide, uh, basically our critical design and safety features, uh, there's a number of things listed here that are directly related to a lot of the concerns that we've heard, uh, questions from the public, uh, the news media, and so forth, as far as our design. Uh, the only safety-related components that we have down at our intake structure are auxiliary saltwater pumps. Those are in watertight compartments. They uh, take in the air needed to operate the pumps and exhaust the air through snorkels that were designed at uh, 45 points. 0.6 feet above the mean lower low water level. So those are almost 46 feet uh, above the, the sea level. All of our remaining safety related equipment is at the 85 foot elevation or higher. The 85 foot elevation is basically the plateau that the main part of the plant sits on and you can see that on the slide uh, on the next page. The freshwater reservoirs that we have built at the plant are actually at an elevation of 310 feet those are two large reservoirs that hold two and a half million gallons of water each, and they can gravity feed down to the plant for a source of makeup cooling water. We also have a steam driven ox feed water pump for each unit. So if we were to lose all AC power, we can still maintain core cooling through heat removal by use of our steam generators. And we would feed the makeup water to those steam generators through the use of a turbine driven pump. So as long as we have the heat in the steam generators to, to generate steam, that steam is used to feed the turbine driven pumps and feed the main steam generators to allow continued uh, core heat removal removal. Our containment structure and our spent fuel pool buildings are both uh, built on and anchored to bedrock. Um, our diesel generators, we have three for each unit. Those are emergency diesel generators. They're used for in the loss of an off-site power. Uh, those uh, three dedicated generators per unit also have the capability to be cross-tied between the two units. So in the event of an accident that goes beyond design basis for loss of electrical power, one diesel generator can be cross-tied and supply vital loads on both units. Uh, our underground diesel storage tanks are watertight compartments. They allow us a minimum of seven days electrical power without need to replenish from outside sources. That was one of the problems at the uh, Fukushima plant. Their diesel fuel storage tanks were actually located above ground and were swept away with the tsunami. Ours are at the 85 foot level underground and well above maximum design tsunami wave height. Uh, finally, we have uh, on-site fire department uh, staffed uh, with three separate crews that are there 24-7. We additionally have two fire engines and associated equipment. Next slide basically gives you uh, a a look at the relative height above sea level for both the Fukushima Diachi plants and for Diablo Canyon. Uh, basically those plants were designed for an approximate 20 foot tsunami but yet they were located only about 20 feet above sea level. As I stated earlier, we're located 85 feet above sea level and our minimum level uh, height for any safety related equipment is at 45.6 feet. Uh, the next couple of slides show you the uh, overview of the site, showing the elevation, so the aerial photo of the plant site. Uh, up above the plant at the elevation 310 feet is where our uh, reservoirs are, the 5 million gallons of cooling water that's available to the plant. Uh, 
the surface of the spent fuel pools is at the 140 foot elevation. The main power block itself, which contains the turbines for both units and the main generators are located uh, at the 85 foot level. And again, the snorkel intakes for our auxiliary saltwater pumps are at the 45.6 foot level. Uh, next slide shows a view from the back of the plant looking out to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is just to give you a feel for our backup uh, on-site tanks, uh, cooling water tanks there. Uh, those are at the 115 foot level, the base of those tanks. Finally, you have another aerial view, gives the overall plant layout and includes the picture of the two, two and a half million gallon raw water reservoirs. As far as the used fuel storage at the plant site, uh, we're currently in cycle 17 on unit one, uh, cycle 16 on unit two. Uh, combined for both units, we have almost 2,600 used fuel assemblies stored at the site. The majority of those are in the spent fuel pools. Both unit one and unit two spent fuel pools have just over 1,000 spent fuel assemblies in those pools. And then we also have our dry cast storage and at that facility uh, located up where the raw water reservoirs are over 300 feet above sea level, we have 516 spent fuel assemblies stored at that location. We have another picture there showing the spent fuel pool in one of the units. And then finally, I want to talk about uh, some of the actions that we've taken as an industry and at Diablo Canyon following two significant events in the world, uh, the first being um, Actually, the second set of guidelines are at the bottom of the page. We created an entire volume of emergency response procedures called severe accident management guidelines. Those procedures were developed in response to lessons learned from Three Mile Island. So as, we, as you've heard before, the nuclear industry is very good about learning lessons from previous events. Uh, so we have a complete procedure set to address beyond design basis accidents. Following the events of 9-11, we recognize that there could be a situation that goes even beyond that where we could lose a significant portion of the plant infrastructure. So we have extreme damage mitigation guidelines. And these are actions in procedures that we train our operators and other members of the plant staff to respond to. So for example, there's been a lot of uh, things in the news about the spent fuel pools at the Japanese facilities. Uh, we already have procedures in place that direct operators to run fire hoses and we can use either the fire trucks or the gravity feed from the raw water reservoirs to keep those pools filled with water. We wouldn't have to spray from a remote fire truck, although in an extreme condition we could even go so far as that. So we have procedures written to address that. Uh, depressurizing the steam generators using our atmospheric steam dumps. This allows a release of steam that acts as the cooling mechanism to keep the core cool. We can also reduce the pressure inside containment. We We've heard that at Unit 2 they had an overpressure condition in their primary containment structure. Our procedures allow us to reduce the pressure and we also have the ability through our procedures to start our emergency diesel generators in the case that we've lost all electrical power so that we can get our backup generators running and supply the needed vital power. We have additional organizational capabilities. Uh, you've heard a little bit of discussion already about our long-term seismic program. We do have at PG&E a dedicated geosciences department. Uh, Mr. Clough here has uh, been a director of that department for many years. We continue to have ongoing seismic studies and analysis of the area around Diablo Canyon. As I mentioned, we do have an on-site fire department, minimum of five people on the plant site at all times 24-7, and the ability to use our two fire engines. We also have a hazardous materials response capability. And then finally, our recurring emergency preparedness training. We have four different emergency response organizations that can fully staff all of emergency uh, facilities. We have dedicated on-site and off-site facilities, and we do periodic tabletop and full scope drills, a minimum of four of those annually. We just did one uh, earlier this month, and we have another one scheduled for next month. 
So finally, industry response. Uh, we have an IMPO event report that was just issued earlier this week. Basically what uh, that action states is that actions provide near-term assurance that each station is in a high state of readiness to respond to both design basis and beyond design basis events. So I talked about the two volumes of procedures that we have. It includes uh, materials and equipment that have to be maintained on site in a state of readiness. Even though we check those periodically, we've gone back this week We've walked down all those facilities, all that equipment, hoses, pumps, whatever we need to verify that they are there, that the procedures are in place, the operators and other personnel are trained to use that equipment. So we are, we have uh, verified that over the last several days to make sure that we can respond to both design basis security events and use our severe accident mitigation uh, guidelines in the event of any design basis event. Thank you very much, Mr. David. Uh, because session is beginning in just a few minutes, I think that this would be a time where we're gonna take a brief break. Thank you for your presentation. I do know that uh, uh, your testimony uh, has raised questions in many of our minds and we will have questions for you a little bit later. We still are going to hear from Carolyn McAndrews when we come back from session with uh, uh, who's uh, with the San Onofre Power Plant in Southern California Edison, uh, Daniel Hirsch, uh, the uh, lecturer at UC Santa Cruz and president of the committee to bridge the gap and Commissioner James Boyd from California Energy Commission. We have a lot of more important information that we will receive by this committee. We're gonna break for a moment. We're gonna go to session. We should be back shortly. Uh, I'm hoping that we can begin this hearing again by no later than uh, 20, 25 minutes after the hour. Um, so if you can please return, I apologize uh, for the uh, break for session, uh, but uh, thank you and we will have questions for you later on. Thank you, we're in recess to return shortly. Thank you.